Amen. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, Trudy, where's Trudy? Trudy. Trudy Cook it handles our uh, prayer chain. And we need to make sure that everyone has, the Trudy has everyone's email address so that in these winter months when the weather's nasty and we have to cancel, we want to notify you. There's a couple of folks that showed up last week uh, and we have apologized and we'll continue to apologize. I don't want that to happen. Uh, but when the weather's really nasty, sometimes we have to cancel and we want to let you know. So if Trudy has your email address, you'll be notified. So when the weather's a little iffy, check your emails. But make sure she's got it, okay? And with that, let's begin. We are continuing our survey of the Bible, and in particular the Old Testament. The Old Testament's made up of four groups of books, the Pentateuch, the books of history, the books of poetry, the books of prophecy. The books of the Pentateuch and the books of history give us the God's history of the world. From the time of the creation up until 400 B.C. when the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity and rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. The books of poetry, poetry and prophecy go back into these years covered by the Pentateuch and the books of history and give us additional information. The books of poetry, uh, which and there are five of them, they give us the history, or they tell us about the hearts and minds of men and women who lived during those years. The books of prophecy tell us about the uh, heart and mind of God during those years. And can we get the pointer to... Remain, it just wants to disappear. It's possessed. It's possessed. All right, there are five books of poetry. See, I, you, I can't do any of this. Without these guys, nothing works. Wait just a moment. You understand that? I have some sympathetic. Every 60 understands. Everybody below 40 doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, there are five books of poetry. The books of Job, the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Job is a poem on suffering. Psalms, a poem on praise and frustration. Not a frustration with God, but a frustration with a world that rejects God. The poets were, were, were outraged by it. They just couldn't understand, and rightly so. The book of Proverbs is a book about divine wisdom, Ecclesiastes, human wisdom, and the Song of Solomon, a poem about love. We have thus far in our examination of the books of poetry uh, examined to some extent the book of Job and the book of Psalms. This evening we're going to take a look at the, books of, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a book of divine wisdom. It is a book in which God tells us how to go out and live skillful lives. Wisdom has been defined as the art of skillful living. And unfortunately, there are just a lot of folks who aren't very good at skillful living. Now, I'm glad you know Christ is your Savior. That was a wise decision. That's the most important decision. That doesn't guarantee that you're going to go out and live skillfully. In fact, a lot of Christians live pretty horrible lives uh, because they just don't manage life well. And what this book is about is this good practical wisdom like for instance, if you want to eat and pay your rent, you've got to go to work. I know you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit, God loves you, and all things work together for good. I know all the excuses. Every pastor who's been in counseling knows exactly what these are. There's this myth that somehow once you get saved, everything's going to work out. Well, it doesn't. And so God gives us this book. It's called the book of Proverbs. And this book, he says, let me tell you how to live skillfully. Get up and work. Manage your affairs. Be nice to your wife. An unhappy wife is an unpleasant thing. Raise your children well. It's a book on wisdom, divine wisdom. Now, in a, 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 next week or the week after, we'll look at Ecclesiastes, which is a book on human wisdom. Eh, not so good. What we really need to do is follow divine wisdom. What God wants us to do is live wise lives. He's, he, he, it's, it's wonderful that you have a spiritual life, but you've got to pay the bills. You've got to support the family. It's very practical, and that's what this is about. 
to a large extent, it's focused on that. And if the truth of the matter is, if you live your life skillfully, you also enhance your spiritual life. There are lots of folks out there who do genuinely love the Lord and would like to serve the Lord, but they do such a wretched job of taking care of everything else, they don't have time. I know men and women who would love to go out and spend time serving the Lord, but they can't pay their bills. They're constantly behind. They overspend. They don't save. They don't take care of, of, of the routine matters of life. And as a result, they don't really accomplish much spiritually either. So that's what the book of Proverbs is about. Now, a proverb has been described as a short, pithy statement that summarizes wisdom. The poet, Spanish poet Cervantes, he wrote Don Quixote. He said it's a short sentence based on long experience. I like that. Now, the, the reason why these are short, pithy statements that summarize wisdom is because uh, the Bible's filled with long sermons on all sorts of subjects. And those are good. But we tend not to remember long sermons on subjects. What we need, what God, he really understands this very well, don't you think? He says, I'm just going to give you a lot of little short statements, and these will encapsulate wisdom, and you'll remember them. Because we tend to remember short, pithy statements, and we tend not to remember long sermons. I wouldn't, I, when I was a younger believer, younger preacher, I would often ask people after the sermon about my message, and I was amazed at how little they remembered. I quit doing it. It was just too embarrassing <laughs> and too discouraging. What did I do? I worked all week for this sermon. I don't even know what I said. Of course, as I got a little bit older, I can't remember what I said. <laughs> so, some examples. Proverbs 11. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. They, and I know people are going to say, this is sexist, take it up with God. <laughs> it could also be read like a gold ring and a pig's snout is a handsome man with no discretion. And that, of course, is the implication. Now, the point here is that we could give our child a long lecture on why it's important to look at something other than outward appearances when he or she is trying to look for a spouse. That's the point here. That long sermon will be forgotten. But a gold ring and a pig snout, that's hard to forget. And that's one of the reasons for Proverbs. See, this is smart. This you will remember. A gold ring and a pig snout, she looks pretty, but she's a pig. And I can say for about men, he looks handsome, but he's really a pig. But then most men are pigs. And then there's Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This is a very simple, and all of us are familiar with this. In fact, the secular world is familiar with this Proverbs. Uh, Somehow, it never, I don't know why it didn't work out too well in the last election, but pride is a horrible, horrible, horrible vice. Pride goes before destruction. We all understand that. And so it's a good thing to avoid. Proverbs, one man said, are like burrs that stick to the mind. And I like that. The, like the, the go ring and the peace mount. You're going to remember that. I could ask you, now that I could ask you about after the lecture and you'd remember it. Because it's like a burr that sticks to the mind. I don't know who said that, but it was a good statement. Let me give you an example of, of that taking place. There's this proverb. The reason why we have two ears and only one mouth is because we need to listen more and talk less. Now, I've heard this most of my life. In fact, oddly enough, I heard it on a TV show last night, a Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> and the, you know the black guy on there? He, he was talking to his son, who wasn't listening. And he said, son, you know why God gave you two ears in my mouth to listen more and talk less? And I thought it was interesting that that sort of po- popped in last night. Now, I, I've heard this off and on for years. And I assumed it came from Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin liked Proverbs. He liked little adages. And I was surprised to learn that it's 2,300 years old. It came from a Greek philosopher named Zeno 2,300 years ago. My point being, is that a bird that sticks to the mind? It's been sticking to 2,300 years worth of minds, which is why God has given us Proverbs 
because he wants us to be skillful at living, and Proverbs help us accomplish that. Now, as pointed out a moment ago, wisdom has been defined in a variety of ways, but my favorite definition is the art of skillful living. We're not talking about spiritual life here. We're talking about the nuts and bolts of going out and living. And one of the saddest things, again, in Christendom is to see so many women who aren't very skillful at living. It's amazing. They're genuinely saved. They love the Lord. They don't really manage much in the kingdom of God because they're stumbling over their inability to just get through the day. Now, sometimes that's beyond our control. I understand that. But often, just a little bit of wisdom would go a long way. And we don't talk about that anymore. We, you know, we want to focus on spirit, people's spiritual lives, and that's good. But we also have to focus on the nuts and bolts of living. And so often we don't live well. And when we don't live well, well, we make a mess of things. Art, the wi wisdom is the art of skillful living. It's not the art of getting rich and powerful. That's not what this is about. Skillful living is the art of making a good life for yourself. And God wants you to have a good life for you. We're gonna, we live in a cursed and hostile world, but it doesn't have to be as bad as we sometimes make it. And <clears throat> wisdom is not a matter of intelligence. It's not a matter of education. It's nice if you're educated. It's nice if you're smart. Life is a little easier, perhaps, if you are intelligent or if you're smart. But there are a lot of very smart people who have, are terrible at living life. There are lots of very educated people who are terrible at living life. They aren't skillful at living. So what we're talking about here doesn't require great intelligence. It doesn't require a great education. It just requires following God's advice in how to go about living skillfully. And that's what Proverbs is about. Now, the first step, God says, in gaining wisdom is to fear the Lord. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Job 28. Because this isn't just in Proverbs, we learn about fearing the Lord's beginning of wisdom. We find about, about this throughout Scripture. Job 28, and he, that is God, said to man, the fear of the Lord is, that is wisdom. Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. So the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now, often when we come up with this word fear, and I heard it so many times when I was growing up in Sunday school, because we'd read through a story in the Old Testament and uh, Abraham feared the Lord, and Job feared the Lord, and Isaac, Isaac feared the Lord. And the teacher would always say, well, that doesn't really mean real fear. That just means respect. That's wrong. It means real fear. Now, it's not a terrifying fear, a ter paralyzing fear. But it's a genuine fear. God is a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and... Uh, when he gets angry, sometimes he reaches out and punishes individuals as well as nations for their wickedness. So it does mean fear. Uh, as I pointed out, some suggest this, it speaks of respect and not fear. The Old Testament saints really did fear God, not a paralyzing fear. Hebrews 10, 31. I like this, pat, this verse. It says, it's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. There's a amount, a, amount of genuine fear that we all ought to have when we approach God. This doesn't mean he, he's not our friend, and doesn't mean that, that he's not the lover of our souls. And one of my favorite images in the Gospels is that of the Apostle John laying his head on our Lord's bosom. That speaks of intimacy and love and genuine affection. And all of those things, they're all true, but he's still God. He's still God. And sometimes I, our church here in the 21st century, I think, it's a little too casual in their attitude toward God. When Isaiah came into the presence of God, and he's a giant, folks, he sh shook. He was terrified. He stood in the presence of God, and it's a terrible thing to stand in the presence of God. So when we talk about fearing God, there's a genuine fear that uh, we should have. Now, wisdom requires more than embracing Christ. I've talked about this already. This is, of course, the wisest decision a person can make. Uh, but more is required for skillful living, and uh, this is laid out for us in the first, the, what, I, the, what I wanted to say about Isaiah, and I couldn't grasp it. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what I should have quoted when I'm getting old, what can I say? But when he was, a, when he was he's taken into the presence of God, he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. That was an expression of fear. 
Was he paralyzed? No. Was he terrified? No. But it was genuine fear because he knew he was a man of unclean lips. Okay. First seven verses sort of lay all this out for us. We need to be skillful at living. So I'm going to read these verses. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. <clears throat> Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. Now, discipline is important. Discipline, I know I'm beginning to sound like a teacher, aren't I? I'm beginning to sound like my father. That's scary. But discipline, I, was, I did not spend my early years living a disciplined life. I didn't much like discipline. I discovered, though, after I became a believer, that discipline actually freed me up to do the things I want to do because I became disciplined enough to do the things that had to get done. And if I was disciplined enough to do the things that had to get done, guess what? I had this free time to go out and indulge myself. So discipline is good. In fact, I would argue that without discipline, you probably will not be successful in life. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple and knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning of these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. That is, those are the first seven verses. They sort of lay the foundation. God wants us all to read these Proverbs, take them to heart, think about them, meditate them on, on them, and live disciplined and what? Successful life. God wants you to make it, it through life. We're not talking about just spiritual stuff here. We're just talking about paying the bills, uh, keeping the, the house in good repair, being nice to your spouse, raising your children, getting along with your neighbors. This is part of the stuff of life. This isn't at all to diminish the spiritual aspects. But again, if you don't get some of this stuff down, you don't have time for the spiritual stuff. Now, the book of uh, Proverbs was written primarily by Solomon. Uh, chapters 1 through 24 were written and assembled by him. Chapters 25 through 29 were written by Solomon and assembled by Hezekiah and a group of his associates 250 years later. Chapter 30 and 31 were not written by Solomon. Chapter 30 was written by a man named Augur, about whom we know nothing. And 31 was written by Lemuel, about, we, about whom we know almost nothing. So it's essentially the book of Solomon minus two chapters. Proverbs 1, 1 tells us about Proverbs' contribution, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then when we come to 24 through 29, these are more Proverbs of Solomon copied by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That was approximately 250 years later. Why Solomon? Why did God choose Solomon to put together a book of Proverbs, a book on wisdom? The answer, a very simple answer, is because he was the wisest man. Most of them remember the story. It's a wonderful story. David died. Uh, Solomon becomes king. God gives Solomon a dream. says, what can I give you? Can I give you riches? Can I give you power? Can I give you prestige? And Solomon, in a moment of brilliance, said, make me wise. This is a wonderful people, make me wise. So God says, I will, and I'm going to make you the wisest man who ever lived. I think he made him the smartest man who ever lived. Now, some may argue with this, but that's not really what this is about. But I think he made him the smartest man. In fact, when you read through the story of the life of Solomon, you realize he was over-the-top brilliant. Now, how many years ago that was? About 3,000 years ago. And Solomon had a number of wives and a lot of children, and those smart genes work their way through the Jewish people. Some of you know where I'm going. Well, consider this. This is not politically correct because we're supposed to see all ethnic groups as being the same, but they're not the same. Each individual is created in the image of God and is valuable to God. But all ethnic groups aren't the same. The Jewish, there are 13 million Jews in the world. That's all. That's one-fifth, one-fifth of 1%. One one-fifth of one percent. That's all. Only 13 million. Until a few years ago, there were more Jews in New York City than there were in Israel. Really? One-fifth of one percent. But they win 22 percent of all the Nobel Prizes. They win 24 percent of all the Nobel Prizes in science. 
And that doesn't count the number of comedians the Jews supplied to the Borscht Belt. And how many writers and journalists, and he goes on and on and on and on, and doctors and lawyers and people knock them for that. To the contrary, I would argue that God made them smart because he knew they were going to be persecuted and they needed to be smart to survive. But I've, I don't know this to be true. But he made sm uh, Solomon the smartest guy going. He said the wise, but you go on in the implication as you work through his life. He's probably the smartest man. And those genes were spread around. So why are we surprised that a group of people who is one-fifth of one percent of the population of the world wins 22 percent of the Nobel Prizes? You know why? Because they're smart. And I think a lot of it's rooted in Solomon. So God had this very smart, very wise guy, and he says, I will choose you to write the book of Proverbs. And uh, he did except for the last two books who were written by all girls, let me know about whom we know almost nothing. Now, the number of virtues that are commended and vices condemned. We're not going to go through all these books of Proverbs, uh, but I, I preach a series of messages on Proverbs. Most of you know all this already from that series, or did you forget it already? Ah. Number of vice, virtues are commended. Devotion to parents. We don't have the right audience for this, but you parents can tell your kids. Devotion to parents. The pursuit of wisdom, often described as a valuable woman. I like how wisdom is described as a beautiful woman who's walking the streets of the cities crying out, will anybody listen to me? And in the world in which we live, almost no one is. The woman that people ignore. The pursuit of wisdom is commended. Generosity is commended. God absolutely does not like stingy people. Faithfulness to the spouses, big issue. This is just a wise decision. Notice, and if you look at the virtues and vices that God talks about in Proverbs, they are smart for anyone, believer or non-believer. This isn't just good advice for believers. This is good advice for anyone. Devotion to parents, pursuit of wisdom, generosity, faithfulness to spouses, honesty in business, hard work in industry. These are commended over and over and over throughout the Proverbs. And the number of vices condemned. Overeating and drinking. I, I'm sorry I put that one in there. The drinking part I understand. The overeating is a little tough at Christmas time. It's probably been better in June. <laughs> Sexual immorality condemned. This was particularly important in antiquity before we had... Uh, uh, antibiotics and the history of the world and its monarchs is sadly a history of sexual immorality and so many of the monarchs in Europe really died of syphilis we know that now because of their incredible sexual morality. they were rich they were powerful and they had the leisure and the uh, position to be sexually immoral and it ended up getting them and the overeating, they overeat it. Henry VIII, one of, one of the great characters in, in British history. Henry VIII was probably 400 pounds, 450 pounds when he died. And he died of syphilis. Terrible shape. And uh, why? did He, he overate and he overdrank. And he also had gout. One of the problems the English aristocracy had was overeating. And also their diet. They, they had, there was this separation between the royalty and the peasants. The peasants weren't, uh, weren't rich enough to, be, to afford very much meat, so they lived on, to a large extent, vegetables. The aristocracy despised vegetables. They lived mostly on meat, so they all suffered from gout. This was the aristocracy, but... What does the proverb say? Don't overindulge in drink. Don't overindulge in food. Don't be sexually immoral. And then he goes on about lying. Laziness, you don't hear that word anymore. You notice? Check it. Check it out. It's almost politically incorrect talking about laziness. When I stumbled across this word putting my notes together, I realized I hadn't heard the word in a long, long time. I remember hearing it when I was a boy. Uh, <laughs> my father mostly was talking to me. <laughs> but I also grew up in Appalachia. And one of the chronic problems in Appalachia 
is laziness. You remember the comic strip Little Abner? Young folks don't know what I'm talking about. This was a comic strip, and it was about a bunch of hillbillies. And I'm a hillbilly, so I took it to heart. And one of the big things, one of the big problems in Appalachia and the world of the hillbillies is laziness. It really, really is. Uh, and Al Cap wrote about that in, in, in his cartoon strip, Little Abner. Laziness is a big problem. And the truth is, it is a big problem in our society today, but no one wants to talk about it because it's politically incorrect and you'll be accused of being a racist. So we don't talk about it. So guess what? The problem isn't solved. One of the first steps in solving, the fact, I would argue, the first step in solving a problem is to recognize you have a problem. Laziness is a big problem in our society today. We have lots and lots of folks on welfare who don't need to be on welfare, and there are folks on welfare who we need to help more. But you know what? You can't if you've got a bunch of able-bodied people who aren't working because they are... Well, you, you can't say the word, can you? <laughs> you can't say it because you, you think this is being recorded and they're going to report you on NBC. <laughs> yeah, you and the other things, along with the president. But laziness is a big subject in the book of Proverbs because God is not politically correct. And he knows this. If you are lazy, you're, gonna have, you're not going to be very skillful at living. You're not going to be very skillful at living. So these are the vices and virtues condemned and commended. Devo virtues commended, devotion to parents, pursuit of wisdom, generosity, faithfulness to spouses is very important. You know the English aristocracy wouldn't have had so much problem, so many problems with syphilis had they been faithful to their spouses. You could wipe out all venereal diseases in one generation if people would follow God's commands. That's the sad thing about it. Honesty and business, hard work, they're all commended. Number of vices, condemned, overeating and drinking, sexual immorality, lying, laziness, and keeping bad company. Keeping bad company is a big issue. We invariably are influenced the folks around us. And if you want to live a good life, Build a, your a relationship with a strong Christian community. I've noticed over the years that men and women come to salvation. Those who really plug into the Christian community have a much higher uh, likelihood of moving on to Christian maturity than those who still hang out with their friends. I had a number of Christians, genuine believers, uh, I believe they're genuine believers, who uh, are saved. They attend church occasionally, but they're still hanging out with their old friends. And you know what? They haven't moved on. Eventually, they just sort of slip away. If you're hanging out with the old friends, that doesn't mean that you have to completely ignore your old friends. But once you get saved, you better plug into a Christian community and develop friendships. One of the things we try to do here is to have fellowship. One of the reasons we have fellowship long month is we need to hang out with each other. Church is more than just coming in and listening to a preacher and singing some songs. Church is supposed to be a family of people who committed to each other, and these should be your friends. Hanging out with good people helps. Peer group helps. So these are vices that are, uh, I mean, these are, <laughs> excuse me, vices condemns hanging out with bad company. All right. Now, we're going to spend some time today and the next week talking about how to interpret the book of Proverbs. And in order to do that, we have to talk about some ways in which the Bible communicates. And the reason this is important is because the book of Proverbs is probably the most misinterpreted book in the Bible. Now, someone will say, no, I think that's Revelation. No, it's probably not Revelation. I'll tell you why. It's the odd millennialists who dismiss a millennium and a tribulation don't even bother with Revelation. John Calvin, my favorite theologian, wrote a commentary, set of commentaries, 14 volumes. Four, that's a lot of writing. And no computer. He skipped Revelation altogether. Which is, what because he, he's amillennial. Well, the church, the whole medieval church was amillennial. That is, they don't believe the future millennium. And so they didn't really believe in some seven-year tribulation that precedes the future millennium. So they just sort of dismissed the book of Revelation. They saw it as some great metaphor. They didn't know what to do with it. John Calvin didn't know what to do with it. He just skipped it. He wasn't suggesting it was a bad book. He just said, I don't know what to do with it. 
And so it, wasn't, it tends not to be poorly interpreted. Uh, for those who are premillennial and believe that the book of Revelation really talks about future events, they tend to get it right. So Revelation isn't the most poorly interpreted Bible, a book in the Bible. The po most poorly interpreted book in the Bible is almost certainly the book of Proverbs. And the reason is this. It's a book of generalizations, not a book of universals. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. All of you will know before this series of lectures is over. It's a book of generalities, not a book of universals. A universal is a statement that is always true no matter what. For example, water always freezes at 32 degrees at sea level, always. The sun always comes up in the morning, always sets in the evening. To the best of my knowledge, there's never been an exception to that. That's a universal. It's a statement that's always true. A generality is a statement that is true most of the time, but there's some exceptions. For example, we could say Democrats like large government, Republicans like small government. Now, that's a true statement, but it's a generality. There are some Democrats who don't like large government, and there are some, real, some, some Republicans who don't like small government. It's a generality. When I make, when I say, make a statement like, men are stronger than women, is that a true statement? Oh, I shouldn't have picked that again. I can't, you can see how politically incorrect I am. It, thank you. There's a bold man. Don't record him. Turn off the turn off. It is a true statement, but it's also a generality. It's a generality. We all know that that statement is a true statement. We also understand that when we communicate, we communicate in a variety of ways. One of the ways is we speak in generalities. We'd have to, otherwise we couldn't talk about a lot of stuff. So that is, is a, the book of Proverbs is a book of generalities. It's a book of principles, not promises. It's not a book of universals. When God talks about a man will, will profit and be successful in life if he gets up and goes to work, that's a generality. Some men get up, go to work, work hard, and don't do well. The Bible is filled with generalities and universals, and you sort of have to sort through them. And the book of Proverbs is a book, for example, of, 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 uh, Solomon talks about being generous with the, with the Lord. If, we, if, we're, if we're generous with our money to the Lord, our barns will be overflowing. You remember that? Basically, what he's saying is, if you go out, son, he's talking to his son, he's son, what I, I want you to be successful in life, and if you are generous with the Lord, your barn will overflow. Now, is that a universal or a generality? Boy, you're not, you're not coming, guy. Thank you. But the guys on TV say it's a universal. That's how seed faith. If you give, God will give. That's his promise. They love quoting those passages of Scripture because that's how they suck money out of their audience. It's dishonest to say things like that. It's a generality. By and large, if you are generous, God says, I'm going to be generous with you. But we know that there are a whole lot of folks in the Bible who are very generous with God, and, and they were poor. In fact, Paul talks about himself and the other apostles being naked and hungry and homeless. It's a generality. And the problem we have, if, if you assume when you've come to the book of Proverbs that it's filled with universals, you're going to misinterpret it. You're going to get a lot of things wrong. So let's talk about some of the ways the Bible communicates. When God wrote the Bible, he wrote it in a way to communicate to us, and he uses many of the same ways we communicate. And that way we we're able to understand. He, he wants, us, uh, wants us to understand a lot of different things, so he communicates to us the way that we communicate with each other. So understanding Proverbs, excuse me, understanding how Proverbs communicates is critical. And as I just pointed out, the book of Proverbs is always often misinterpreted. We communicate with each other in a variety of ways. Symbols. Jesus Christ, for example, is the Lamb of God. When, that's a statement we all understand. No one thinks that it's a, a, he's a creature with four legs and, and uh, a coat of fur. We communicate in parables. Jesus, when he, when he taught in parables, he wasn't trying to teach about farming and fishing, though he often used farming and fishing metaphors to communicate we understood what he's talking about. And the Bible is filled with approximations. The number of 
people in the tribes or men killed were often approximations. We use approximations. That's a common way of talking. If, if someone on uh, one of the talking shows on TV was talking about population situations around the world, he'll talk about the United States having 325 million people. That's roughly what we have. That's the figure that is going now. But is that exactly correct? No, of course not. And he might talk about Germany having 85 million people, France 70 million people, the United Kingdom 65 million people. Now, he could make those statements and no one is going to challenge him as not knowing what he's talking about just because the figure isn't precise. We communicate with approximations. Because the truth is, at any given moment with the population of any of these countries are. All we can know is what they approximate. The time you count from one end to the other, guess what? It's all changed because people die and people are born. And it would be too cumbersome. So we talk, we communicate in approximations. And so, by the way, does the Bible. If you go through the books of Leviticus and Numbers, you'll find that when God came, it came time to count the men and the tribes of Israel, God used approximations, like here. When he talked about the, 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 the men in the tribe of Levi, they numbered 23,000. Was that figure exact? But you know, the skeptic likes to say, well, then there's an error. I thought you said the Bible was inspired and inerrant. Well, you've got to understand the way the Bible communicates. It communicates the way we communicate. Now, you need to understand this when you start approaching. It also speaks in appearances. The Bible talks about the sun rising and the sun setting. So do we. But does it rise and set? No, it doesn't. This has to do with the rotation of the earth. So someone said, well, there's an error. No. The Bible speaks about appearances and summarizations. Summarizations. Often when the Bible talks about things like genealogies, they'll just summarize them. These are some of the ways the Bible communicates, which incidentally is exactly how we communicate. We communicate in symbols, we communicate in parables, in approximations, appearances, summarizations. Now what I'm leading to is the really important issue in communication in the book of Proverbs, which are generalizations and universals. A generalization is a statement that is true, but with some exceptions. We understand that. We use, I just went through a list. I just commented on some of the ways that we speak in generalizations. It's a, an accepted method of communication. And the Bible also uses universals. These are statements which are always true, no exceptions. Let's just look at a few. Proverbs, as I've just pointed out, is a book of generalizations. Wearsby wrote, Proverbs are generalizations about life and not promises to claim. If you start claiming these promises, you're going to get in trouble. They're generalizations, or as someone said, they're principles, not promises. All right, we just talked a moment ago in that politically incorrect statement. Men are physically stronger than women. Is that a generalization? We all can make, we can make that statement, and I don't even think the liberal press would be too upset about it. Roy Steinman might be angry about it, but nobody else is. Europeans are anti-Semitic. Now, that's an interesting generalization. I think that you could still make that statement today without getting too much trouble. Several years ago, uh, the, uh, I I the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, killed the leader of Hamas. And immediately the European press went bonkers. And uh, writing about that issue, Peter, Ralph Peters, you remember no, Pal Colonel Ralph Peters, he's on... Fox News from time to time, wrote this in the New York Post. Yesterday, European leaders reflectively attacked Israel for killing the founder of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, a man bathed in the blood of innocent men, women, and children. Don't be misled. Their rhetoric, rhetoric simply reflected the continent's cherished tradition of anti-Semitism. Now, I just want to focus on that statement, anti-Semitism. No one the folks, of course, wouldn't like his statement, but no one who read that statement said, Ralph Peters does not know what he's talking about because I know one Frenchman who's not an anti-Semite. You understand what I'm getting at? Everybody understood that he was, we understood. He didn't have to say, oh, I'm speaking in generalizations. Everybody understood that he was speaking in what? Generalizations. Because Europe does have a long history of anti-Semitism. Now, people say, well, no, you're only talking about Germany. 
in World War II. No, my friends, it goes back thousands of years. And if you think Germany was totally responsible for the Holocaust, you know nothing about the history. The Vichy government in France was tur turned over thousands and thousands of Jews to Germans to go to the concentration camps and be gassed. And so did the Poles, and so did Europe. In fact, anti-Semitism is a rage in Europe right now. Jews are leaving by the thousands because anti-Semitism is it's part of their tradition. But does that mean everybody in Europe is an anti-Semite? Of course not. There, there were, even during World War II, there were, there were non-Jews who sacrificed their lives to protect Jews. My point in all this is he can, you can make a statement about the anti-Semitism in Europe. People will believe what you say. They know that's true. They also know you're speaking in what? Generalizations. Discussions about politics require generalizations. I once thought about how could we communicate effectively if we didn't have generalizations? It'd be impossible. Democrats like larger government, Republicans like smaller government. Democrats like higher taxes, Republicans like lower taxes. Now, none of these statements are absolutely perfectly true in every respect. They're not universals, but it's generally true. Democrats like more government regulations, Republicans like fewer government regulations. Now, Democrats may not like the way I phrased it, but everyone knows these are generalizations and that they are true as generalizations. But they're also universals in life. We don't only speak in generalizations, we speak in universals. All life needs food, clothes, excuse me, food, food, water, and air. Is that absolutely true? Are there any exceptions? No exceptions. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. Absolute. The sun rises every morning and sets every evening. These are universals. They're always true, no exceptions. We speak in universals and generalizations, and so does the Bible. Generalization is a statement that is true, with some exceptions. And universal is a statement that is always true, and we understand these. Now, they're also found in the Bible. God inspired men to communicate the way we communicate. Christians tend to view, this is our problem, view generalizations as being universals. And this is what I was getting at a moment ago when I talked about the book of Proverbs being so poorly interpreted. It's the most misinterpreted book in the Bible. Why? Because, and I've been around 45 years in Christendom, and I can tell you, most of the Christians I've ever talked to about the book of Proverbs believe that the generalizations in the book of Proverbs are universals. They claim them as promises. And then they're disappointed and they think God let them down. They do. Because think about this. If you raise a child and the way she go when he's older, he'll not depart from it. And I'm going to claim that as a promise. Well, then you're making a big mistake. It's a generalization. It is not a universal. They think it's a guarantee. It is not a guarantee. It's a what? And so, well, why would, we assume we get to the Bible for some reason. We all under, the reason I went through this whole list of generalizations that, that uh, we, we, we use in our society, the reason I went through those is to remind you that we speak in generalizations. We all understand them. We all understand what generalizations are. I talk about politics. We talk about anti-Semitism, about the strength of men and women. We all understand those are generalizations. But when we get to the Bible, we forget all that and make sure that we claim them all as universals, and then we're disappointed. And the sad thing is I've seen people walk away from the faith because they claimed a generalization as a promise. They claimed the book of the generalizations, and frankly, the book of Proverbs is a book of generalizations. They claimed it as promises. They didn't come through and they think God lied to them, and they walk away from the faith. That's the reason of this whole buildup, guys. This is a really important issue. It's not an academic thing. Men and women look at that as a promise. And I know, you know I've, I, I've seen men and women who work very hard to raise their children in a godly manner. Hard. Solid believers, consistent, hardworking, training, one kid becomes a drug addict, dies of an overdose. And the mother says, but God promised. If I'd raise him in the way he should go, when he's old, he wouldn't depart from it. And he did. I guess God lied. Then there's always that individual when the woman is upset, maybe after she recovers a little bit, talking about the situation. This is the worst. 
someone talking about it says, well, I know why the child went down the tubes. Because she didn't raise him the way he should go. Because God said if you raise a child in the way he should go when he's old, he won't depart from it. He didn't. He died as an, an, an overdose, a stone pagan. She, they must have failed. They must have done a lousy job. So she loses her son. And she's also had to deal with this Christian who doesn't know what Proverbs is all about. Am I upset? I'm upset. She doesn't need that. It's a lie. You understand how important it is to know how to interpret Proverbs? Actually, how important it is to interpret the Bible correctly. How important it is to interpret the Bible correctly because a lot of folks are hurt because we blow it. Christians tend to view generalizations as universals. We know about generalizations. We get to the Bible. They're all promises. It's not so. Again, God communicates with us the way we communicate with each other. That's helpful. Actually, God has a lot of generalizations in the book of Proverbs that we need to have. He wants to say, you want to be prosperous in life, get up hard, get up early from morning, go, go to work. Now that's, is that a true generalization? He wants you to know about that. But if, he, if you can't accept the fact he speaks in generalizations, how can he communicate that? He can't. Let me go ahead. Universals in the Bible. The Bible's filled with generalizations. It's filled with universals. Genesis 17.1. To begin with, God is omnipotent. Now, when, now you say, how can you tell the difference between a universal and a generalization in the Bible? Well, I'll tell you about the universals. I know it's universal if God, if there's nothing in the Bible ever suggests anything at odds with that statement. And I know that it's a generalization if the Bible points out to me that there are exceptions. Exceptions or no exceptions, that's all. Now, let's say the Bible talks about God being omnipotent. And guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does God, any, any passage of Scripture suggests that he's not omnipotent. So I know when I read a statement about God's omnipotence, that's a universal. Genesis 17, 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Genesis 18, 14. God asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for him? No. Weak, weak, guys, weak. <laughs> Job 42, 2. I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Matthew 19, 26. With God, all things are possible. We could go on and on and on. The Bible, when God, the Bible tells us that God is omnipotent, that's a universal statement because nowhere will you find a suggestion that there's an exception to that. Same thing about God's omniscience. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. This is totally amazing. God is holy and just and righteous. Does the Bible ever suggest otherwise? Nope. That's universal. Men are born sinful and separated from God. Does the Bible ever suggest otherwise? Nope. Salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone. Is this a universal or a generality? Universal. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. I know that's universal because the Bible never suggests otherwise. So the Bible's filled with universals. But you've got to look around and say, oh, is that statement a generalization or a universal? Look for suggestions of exceptions or not. Now, generalizations. The Bible tells us uh, makes a lot of generalizations. Proverbs, for example, speaks of a long and prosperous life for those who obey the Lord. Proverbs 3, 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands. Or in this particular case, Solomon's talking to his son, and he's speaking in the, in, the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, so he's talking about God's commands. So keep my commands, or God's commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Proverbs 4, 10. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. Now, basically, what he's saying here is if you obey the Lord, you'll have a long and prosperous life. Is that not what he's saying? That's what he's saying. And I'll tell you what, as you work your way through Proverbs, he makes statements like that over and over and over again. Basically, if you obey the Lord, you'll have a long and prosperous life. But what about Jonathan? Remember Saul's son? He, did, he didn't live, have a long and prosperous life, did he? He died as a young man. Well, he must, he must have been a bum. I don't think so. We're talking about Jonathan, son of Saul, who was a friend of David, stood against his father. It's hard to find a more godly man than young Jonathan, but he didn't have a long and prosperous life. And what about Stephen? I mean, this is the fellow 
And God devoted a whole chapter to the book of Acts to this godly young man who stood up and defended the gospel against the religious leaders of Israel even while they were stoning him, and he cried out, God, forgive them. Now, was he a godly man? I would argue he is. Did he have a long and prosperous life? Oh, so I guess the Proverbs lied to us, didn't they? I'm pushing the issue because I've seen this thing interpreted so badly so many times, it's maddening. It's maddening. The man dies young. Well, he must, have had a God, must, not, must not have been living a godly life because Proverbs promises that if you live a godly life, you will have a long and prosperous life. Those are what? Thank you. Proverbs speaks about God filling the barns for those men and women who are generous. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim with, over with new wine. Malachi 3, 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw, away, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough. In other words, God is promising here to fill our barns if we're generous with him. TV guys love this. Shame on them. Is this a promise? If you're doing this with God, we know better, don't we? Paul wrote, and I know because I can look in the Bible and find exceptions to that statement. Paul wrote, to this very hour, we apostles go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Now, I guess maybe they weren't generous with God, right? I don't think so. So I can look at the statement that we just read in Proverbs about being generous with God and God filling our barns. I can look at this and say, that's a generalization. Why? Because the apostles were hungry, thirsty, and homeless. I've heard Christians say, God has promised. Th times get tough. And I'm sure you've heard this. Times are tough. Well, I don't worry about it too much because God has promised to always give me food, clothing, and shelter. Do you think God has promised to always give you food, clothing, and shelter? No, he hasn't. In Proverbs, God made a statement about prospering those who are generous with him, a lot of statements about God prospering those who are godly and follow his commands. But those are generalizations because I can go and find examples of some of those godly men and women in the scriptures who had no food, had no clothing, had no shelter. Grow up, folks. You want the This is the truth. And they don't come much God's. And you say, well, it, they'll point to some individual who is without food, clothing, and shelter and suggest he wasn't a godly man. Well, you just knocked off all the apostles. They don't get much godly in that bunch. And let's read another one in Hebrews. You say, well, those are New Testament guys. No, what about the Old Testament guys? Some of the great Old Testament faced jeers and flogging while they, others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about and Listen to this. These are great Old Testament. This, by the way, chapter is God's Hall of Fame. So you don't have to guess about whether or not these were godly folks. God says, these are the best of the best. How well did they do? Well, let's see how well. They were stoned. That didn't seem too good. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins. What's this word? They were destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. It's talking about the coming kingdom. So, Proverbs speaks of God filling the barns of those who are generous. He might. He might not. But in general, is that true? In general, it's true. You look through the Old Testament, look through the New Testament, look around. Look at Christendom. I've, looked, I, I've, 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 I've known a lot of folks in these last 45 years as a Christian, and I can tell you absolutely that those who are generous with God tend to do so much better than those who are stingy. Is that statement true in Proverbs? Of course it is. But as a generalization is generally true. What God is trying to say, folks, this is how I want you to live your life. Go out and be generous, be obedient, and you will prosper. It's not a promise. It's not an absolute, but it's generally true. Okay. Proverbs speaks of, uh, our time is up. We've gone way out. 
I ran on too long. So we'll we'll close here. You want to stay and finish this up and do something else? Then? Hands. We'll finish. Proverbs speaks of hard work making men prosperous. Twelve eleven. He who works his land will have abundant food, but he who chases fantasies lacks judgment. Proverbs 14, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk only leads to poverty. These are good suggestions, are they not? Proverbs, lazy hands, that word lazy again. Lazy hands makes a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Proverbs, the, the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. These are generalizations. Is this, look around yourself and see if this isn't true in general. Of course it is. Proverbs tells us that well-trained children will eventually do well. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Uh, well, how well? That did work for King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is one of Israel's greatest kings. He also reads one of King Israel's worst kings, Manasseh. In fact, Manasseh was offering up his children to the god Moloch in the Valley of Hinnon. And he was so bad God sent the Assyrians to capture him, take him back, and put him in a prison in Babylon where he repented, and God restored him. So actually, Hezekiah's work worked out for him, but not on all these. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, you know, these were serving with him in the temple, as, or in the tabernacle as priests, and they offered strange fire. How well did they do? God sent fire and devoured them. So had Aaron raised them to be a godly? I suspect he did, but they didn't turn from their wickedness. Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, Eli is interesting. Hophni and Phinehas were disgusting. They would seduce women who came to the tabernacle to offer sacrifices. They would take part of the sacrifice for themselves and eat it rather than return it. In fact, God had them killed by the Philistines in battle. And you say, well, uh, Eli must not have raised them in a godly fashion because if you train a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he will not turn from it. Well, Eli also raised Samuel. So how do you put those things together? The only way you can do it is recognize that Proverbs 22, 6 about training a child is a generality. But is it a true generalization? You've got two, fam two groups of families. You've got one family, group of families over here that really work hard at raising their children in a godly way or just a, just a sensible way, whether they're godly or not. And you've got a group of folks over here with no father, absentee mother. They don't raise their kids in a godly fashion. We all know what the odds are. I don't have to go to the Bible to find out what's going to happen. Sociologists will tell me that there are ethnic groups in, this, in, in our world, in our country, in which the fathers are absent, the kids aren't trained, and a lot of them are in prison. So if the family works hard at raising their children well, the odds are pretty good the kids will do okay. If families do nothing, the odds are pretty good that the kids aren't going to turn out so well. Is that a true, a true generalizations? That's the point, and that's the way you have to take this. Aaron's sons did not do Eli's. Eli's sons did not do well. David raised both Absalom and Solomon. One great, one horror. Adam gave us both Cain and Abel. Same parents, same family. King Saul, a bum, raised the godly Jonathan. So trade up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. It's a generalization. But it's generally true, but it's a generalization. Sexually immoral. Lead, I'm not going way too long. I apologize. Anyway, well, I'm going to zinc through them. Sexual immorality leads to spiritual and physical death. I'll leave that for you in the notes. How's that? My favorite generalization from the Apostle Paul. Even one of their own prophets, Paul wrote to his friend Titus, said this. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy guns. My favorite. This is so Im politically incorrect. They're cringing at NBC. Now, when Paul wrote this, does he mean that every single Cretan was a liar, an easy brute, and a lazy glutton? No. This is another example of a generalization. But it's a nice one. I mean... Uh, I skipped a couple about sexual immorality and all that, but you can read those and you know. So the whole point was, if you're sexually immoral, immoral, it will come, you won't do well. And the truth is, you probably won't. But you might if you get saved. Ah, 
I'm ramp wandering around. I, I shouldn't have said that. Listen to this. Sexual immorality leads to spiritual and physical death. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, do you, do you not know that a wicked, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders or thieves, nor the greedy, nor dunkers, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were. That's the point I was trying to get at. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm filling off, what I was trying to spin off of was some Proverbs where it said, if you're sexually immoral, you're going to go down to the grave. That's probably true, particularly before the age of antibiotics. But not everyone, if you were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Okay. Wisby wrote, and we'll close on this, Proverbs are generalizations about life, not promises for us to claim, although there are some great promises to be found in the book of Proverbs. The basic requirement for understanding and applying these Proverbs is the fear of the Lord and a willingness to obey. <clears throat> the aim of the book is to give the godly person skill and human relationships and endeavors. This begins with submission to the Lord. It is dangerous to lay hold of one or two statements in Proverbs but ignore the total message of the book. Also, though you, we can find examples of exceptions to some of the Proverbs, this does not minimize the lesson they contain. Not all godly people will live long lives or become wealthy. In some parts of the world, believers are dying from famine and poverty. But generally speaking, those who obey God do not ruin their bodies or waste their substance. The book of Proverbs summons, summons us to understand and apply all of God's revealed wisdom to all of life. That's a great summary from a really astute theologian and Bible teacher. I'm sorry I went over. <clears throat> I'll do better next week. I hope. That's a generalization. <laughs> Father, we love you and we worship you. What a great God you are. I thank you for this book. I pray, Lord, we take it to heart and live lives that are pleasing to you. I pray that we will live skillfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.